Um, it is a pleasure to have you all here. And I, I actually want to thank John, right? He's leading climate change discussions at the White House. And so I don't find it at all ironic that he brought us rain. I think it was quite brilliant. Perhaps you can come back more regularly, bring some of the water from DC out here. Um, so this morning, we are going to try to open the day by a conversation about what are these values, right? People are talking about, well, we have privacy concerns, there are risks in big data, there are benefits in big data. We want to be a little bit more concrete about some of the interests, some of the value commitments, as Anno said, in law, public policy, in our professional codes of conduct, in the norms around how businesses or educational institutions or the healthcare sector operate that might be at risk in the big data environment and how we ought to be thinking of those in a rigorous way because in order for us to work with these concepts in technical systems, in business processes, or in new law, we need to understand very clearly exactly what the concept means so we can express it appropriately. Um, in, in beginning the exercise of thinking about the structure of this workshop, um, I was brought back to 1973, and it was at a time not unlike our own, right? There were breathtaking revelations of government overreaching into private lives secret data banks with questionable legal authority and at times illicit goals that caught the population off guard. There were reports, as we've seen today, um, not necessarily today, but in, in the recent past, about um, systems of files of information, metadata, other sorts of data of citizens. And there were committees convened and hearings held and studies and reports issued. Um, and the inquiries then were coming on the heels of Watergate they unearthed peculiar data banks. They unearthed things with illegitimate names. There were blacklists of scientists and advisors and systems of political surveillance. Um, and most remarkably from the perspective of legislators and committees that were looking at this issue, there was a lot of desire to keep activities shrouded from public view. There was a, a deep commitment to secrecy. And so looking forward to where we are today, one of the things that I find most interesting is the fact that we are not only having these conversations, but that the administration said we need to have these conversations about big data, about the way in which government uses information, the private sector uses information, the way in which information is crossing borders and boundaries in a public setting, that we need to engage affirmatively um, that shroud, being shrouded and being secret about the uses of information that are governing and influencing and shaping our lives across all these sectors is not something that's appropriate in a free and open society. That what we need to do is have a frank and honest conversation about our values and how we deal with an issue such as privacy, concerns around um, discrimination and fairness, and equity and access um, in a way that is robust and meaningful and enables public participation because these are defining moments of our time. And so to start the day off today on this set of questions, um, I am really delighted to be joined by Amalia Deloney from the Center for Media Justice, um, Fred Kate, law professor from the University of Indiana, Nicole Ozer, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Director at the Northern California ACLU, and Kenneth Bamberger, a professor here at UC Berkeley's School of Law. And they're going to help us through a nice navigation of some of these values that are going to guide our conversation and our search for good questions and good solutions today. So I wanted to open it up with this question of transparency. Um, so in 1973, we had this classic text that was written, the HEW report associated very strongly with Willis Ware, um, who recently passed away, leading computer scientist of the day. Um, and transparency, the idea that there should be no secret record keeping systems, was a core component of the both privacy and due process protections that were set forth to deal with, at that point, what were called automated data processing systems. We've come a really long way. Um, and transparency is very much what we see today as kind of a first response. Transparency with respect to public process, 
but also we've seen enormous efforts by companies to be more transparent about how they collect information, how they use information, how they provide information to the public sector for national security and law enforcement purposes. And I wanted to open it up um, with a question for Professor Kate, who's written a fair amount on questions of transparency and how far they get us in thinking about a value such as privacy um, in the marketplace and some of its limitations. So, Fred, I was wondering if you could talk about, when you think about transparency today, what are some of the challenges we face in an environment that isn't about big databases being held by big entities alone? Um, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here. Um, I think transparency, first of all, I think we have to think about whether we later merge them together, but think about separately government uh, big data systems and private sector big data systems. Because HEW was very focused on government and that the government has a, in, in the HEW reports view, constitutional obligation not to engage in uh, secret, uses of, uh, secret uses of data. Um, I, I think transparency, whether in public or private sector though, we have to think of as serving some very different roles. So, so one is just to be aware that the data are being used. And, and in that sense, it's a, it's a pretty critical role, but it's a role that frankly most of us aren't interested in. I mean, people in this room are interested in, but we're kind of an odd group. You know, most people on the street are just not interested. And we've learned this as we've uh, tried to deal with transparency, for example, through notices and things which people overwhelmingly, not really ignore, but resent. You know, they're having to click through them to get what they want, and transparency at that point is not terribly useful. In fact, might be counterproductive. On the other hand, think about transparency you get with something like the Fair Credit Reporting Act, where if your credit report is used in a way that negatively affects you, you get notice at a time you most care about it. You know, you're being denied credit, your uh, uh, premiums are going up, and you're told, now we have clear transparency, and it's, it's partnered with redress. In other words, you get some rights around the data, not just you get to be told, by the way, you have no choice, but here it is, but you actually get the chance to say, I want to see my credit report, I want to dispute accuracy, I want to be able to challenge uh, wh whether this is an ap appropriate use of information. Um, I think in the government sector, by contrast, transparency may serve some other um, pretty critical roles, and that is, again, coming out of what I would still argue, in line with the HEW report, are constitutional values, that we should know what our government is up to, and whether individually we care about that or not, it's critical to make sure as a way of, of, of monitoring government, so as you think of advocates, as you think of Congress, as you think of oversight, transparency becomes critical to that. Then we can try to translate that to the private sector and say, you know, what would that look like as well? So transparency might really be focused on, if you will, the pressure points, the points where influence can be exercised, so that, it, so that instead of the, uh, this sort of transparency in this sort of mechanistic sense of generating notices, we think of it as making the information available so that an advocacy group or a regulator can then go examine it and uh, um, apply the law as appropriate to that. Let yeah. me stop there. Anyway. So Ken, um, you and I, and then you independently, have done a fair amount of thinking about different ways in which um, regulat regulatory approaches to transparency can actually spur more privacy protective or other sorts of behaviors in the marketplace. And we looked at things, for example, in Europe, there are some um, countries in which one has to register databases, and that's a form of transparency both in the public and the private sector. We've looked at security breach notifications, which are much more of this Fair Credit Reporting Act model of a notice when there's some meaningful action that's happened that might actually allow people to respond. Um, you've also thought about the relationship between transparency and oversight and accountability and our tripartite system of government. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those forms of transparency and how they relate to this conversation about big data. Um, I, I think there are two points worth saying about transparency. First is to make a distinction between kind of bureaucratic openness, <laughs> uh, a kind of formal transparency, and a transparency that actually gives meaningful information uh, to the public and to decision makers. So if we're talking about, you know, in a sense, privacy policies are a form of transparency, uh, as Fred suggests, but nobody reads them. And in fact, you know, they, they contain kind of 
the, the secret bombs inside of them. So in, in a way, transparency has been regularized and bureaucratized in such a way that nobody's actually looking at what's going on the, under the hood. So that's one form of transparency, and you see it in Europe as well. So many times the requirement that European companies file forms and register all of their uses of data, <laughs> technically they provide a set of information that someone theoretically could use, but too often they end up just creating uh, 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 file cabinets full uh, or computers full, uh, too often file cabinets, but also compu <laughs> computers full of data that, that's, that's not in any useful form. The second type of transparency is the type of transparency that we've seen uh, from things like uh, the data breach notification laws, which uh, have, have changed the public dialogue about the use of data because uh, uh, again, as Fred suggests, at those points, people are actually receiving data at a, at a point, receiving information and, and notice at a point that's important. Um, that's the first point about transparency. The second point, uh, uh, quickly, is uh, transparency is only useful um, as the very beginning of the conversation. The, the creating the ability to actually have the open conversation about values. Because what we're talking about here is power. And uh, too often, uh, there's a formal notion of, of power uh, in the notion that consumers, if you are transparent about how their information is used, they can then meaningfully consent or not consent to the use of that data in each individual case. In a world of big data, where uh, data is flowing back and forth at all times from multiple different sources, and no one knows often exactly how it's being used, these questions of power can't be overcome by, by simply individual choices. Excellent. So Amalia, I wanted to bring this power piece and the idea of transparency <coughs> to you. Um, some of your work and some of your focus is looking at the way in which data reflects existing inequalities right, in society. And transparency around individuals' data might be really interesting, but in fact, the devil is perhaps in that mass of data on which algorithms are running. And what sorts of, when you think of transparency, is there utility in transparency? Is it about the individual's data? Is it about the data sets? Is it about the algorithms? What are some of the challenges that you're seeing as someone working on issues of equality and fairness? So I'm very excited that the first question that comes to me starts with the word power. Um, and I think that it's important because I sit here, you know, as someone who was trained as an attorney and works in policy, but I'm an organizer, you know? And so that, that situates us in this conversation in a very different place. We want to talk about power in our communities. And most often we're talking about how power is used over us rather than with us. And so when this question of transparency comes up around big data, you know, I, I think back to what it means to be part of the Media Action Grassroots Network, which is where I work. And, and we often say that the right to communicate should belong to everyone. And we talk about that right to communicate not as sort of an ephemeral right, but about a right rooted in power, that there's power in terms of communication and what you're allowed to communicate about and who you're allowed to communicate to. And at the same time, what is communicated about you and what does that mean for your life? So when we entered into this conversation recently um, with other allies in the civil rights and public interest uh, community, we felt like we had to take these words like transparency and make them real. Because for the average person, as it's already been brought up, you know, what does transparency really mean? And so one of the ways we did that is by establishing principles that really guide how we're approaching this work. And we think about them as um, proactive principles, right, that should shape the conversation rather than principles that sort of react to a situation that's out there. We want to be innovative. We want to be creative. We want to be visionary. And so I'll be referring to them at different times. I just want to start by sort of reading the five and then circle back to the transparency piece. So principle one is stop high-tech profiling. And we'll talk more about that. Two is ensuring fairness in automated decisions. Three is preserving constitutional principles. Four is enhancing individual control over personal information. And five is protecting people from inaccurate data. And I think in and of themselves, they all speak to aspects of transparency that make it more real for people in their lives. Certainly, I think for us, what we see is that um, this is both an individual struggle and a, and a community struggle. 
that the information that's generated, whether it's through data collection on a single source, algorithms that are mathematical or scientific, um, predictive behaviors that are built around kind of assessing communities and network patterns, all of this shapes a story that's very challenging for communities who come, um, who enter into this conversation at a power spectrum spot that that is challenging, that they that already feels oppressive and already feels like there's a tremendous amount of bias, particularly racial bias. And so I think for us, you know, these conversations and principles are important, but if we separate them from the social realities of people's lives, I think they feel like just one more solution um, that isn't really attached deeply to the problem. So let's talk, Nikki, a little bit about some of the ways that these projects that use big data are coming into existence, particularly in the public sector at the local level, and some of the transparency challenges that you've seen as somebody who focuses on this issue here in the state of California. <coughs> yeah, when I, when I think about big data, I think about a lot of different buckets that are happening in our current reality. So when the federal government through the Department of Homeland Security and others is funding billions of dollars in surveillance technology in the form of drones and license plate readers and stingray trackers and facial recognition and domain awareness centers right here in Oakland, um, you know, this technology is designed as big data technology to suck up and collect and mine vast amounts of information about who we are and where we go and what we do and who we know. Um, and the government doesn't even have any kind of requirements for public process or privacy and free speech safeguards, or as Amalia was talking about, sort of evaluation and auditing to sort of make sure that these systems, these big data systems, aren't used for discriminatory purposes. So, that's sort of one bucket of big data I see where the government is deploying these big data technologies. Um, the second is that you know we sit here in the Bay Area and many of us are increasingly using online services and it's really become this very tangled web of online services and advertisers and data brokers and third party apps. Um, you know, that are collecting vast amounts of information and sharing and selling really sensitive things about our personal lives, um, about our health, about um, where we go, about even personal tragedies. Um, and then we've got sort of the third bucket where the government is increasingly taking advantage of really outdated laws to engage in, you know, a pretty much a warrantless shopping spree in these treasure troves of information um, that the companies are collecting. And so we have sort of these three buckets of big data. Um, there's a lot of sort of solutions that have to happen throughout that entire data ecosystem, but I do think that there are some sort of sensible steps, some ways that we can sort of start to approach that conversation. There's some low hanging fruit right now that you know, as technology has advanced over the last decade that we know need to happen. Um, you know, that laws like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act need to be updated, that there needs to be some actual real transparency about what data is collected and being shared about us. Um, some sort of real sens sensible steps that can be put into place. And I hope that today is sort of the beginning. And as Nicole said, hopefully we'll be continuing this conversation because this hasn't developed overnight. Um, and it isn't going to be solved overnight, but I, I'm very pleased that, um, you know, we're going to be hopefully moving in the right direction on these issues. So I'm going to push Nikki a little bit as a former student. I feel really entitled to do that. Um, she was my first, actually, RA. Um, and I'm very proud of everything that she's done since. But so Nikki, you talked a lot about buckets and you talked about issues and the law needs to be updated, but wh why? What is privacy for? What is at risk? What are the values? Why do you care? Why should we care? I mean, here in California, probably what privacy means and why it's important and what is at stake is 
you know, probably clearer than anywhere in the country. Do you just I actually would argue it's <laughs> never clear, right? <laughs> I, I, privacy is an essentially contested concept. Yeah. It is this word that gives us an opportunity to have meetings like this and venues like this and public conversations where we debate what sort of rules we need in order to live the life that we want to have and have the sort of democratic society we value. So it is not self-evident. Right? And I need, we need you to help us articulate. We've heard about power, we've heard about gov accountability, we've heard about people being able to control information. I, wanna, I want people to really richly and deeply understand what is at stake. So what are these values? What are our concerns? Well, I think that privacy means different things to different people because what's at stake for different people is different. Um, but what's at the core is that privacy is about being able to control one's private life. That you can, you know, in California, it's the right to be left alone. You know, it's fundamental and compelling. It's not just about the government intruding, but it's about private parties also intruding. It's our ability to control information and to stop the proliferation of both business records and government records over which we have no control. Deirdre started the conversation today about what had happened in the 1970s, and it was directly in response to that that California voters overwhelmingly passed the Privacy Amendment in the 1970s with the direct intent to address this modern threat to privacy that's now sort of what we call big data. So this issue isn't new, but what's happened since the 1970s is the things that we imagined might be possible that both private parties and the government would be able to track us without us knowing, be able to learn really sensitive information about what was happening behind our closed doors in our homes or in our bedrooms. Um, that's what's come to pass as you know, technology has advanced and business models have radically changed. And the question we're posed with right now is what are we going to do about it? Um, so Fred, do you feel less free do you feel like you have less privacy today? Is control, the, is that the aim? Should we be aiming for individuals to have control? Right, so you suspected I would have something to <laughs> say about this. Um, I, I think, and so do others I hear as well, I think the problem of not having a definition of privacy is a real one because we use it, it's in Surely. lots of laws. We know what we're talking about when we talk about murder or when we talk about fraud. When it comes to privacy, we have no earthly idea. I think in the context of- No, the, we have lots of ideas. No, we have no shared ideas, though. Okay. And even, even when Nicole says, and I totally agree with you, but I think it highlights the problem, it depends on who you're asking. You can't legislate on that basis. You can't say, here's a right that depends on who you ask. You've got to be able to define it in some way. In the context of probably government and private sector, but, but for, to start with government, I think it actually is largely about a restraint on power. It's saying there's certain things the government should not be able to do. It's about the relationship of citizens to their government. So, and let's, so historically we've thought about that relationship being in part grounded in the Fourth Amendment, right? This idea that the government would have to have a warrant, right? To come and get our papers and our effects. And we've had protections for communications historically. Today, much of the kind of movement of data and the use of data is about this thing called metadata, which is not the content of our communications, but all these emanations of our devices and our internet of things and our fridge and our car, right, talking about us and what we're doing. And how should, how does that fit into that framework? I, I think when you think about, again, the government side of this, once you think about privacy as a restraint on power, it doesn't matter what you're talking about then. It's a restraint on power. And that's why when the government says, well, we did this because it's really effective. Well, you know, general searches were really <laughs> effective as well by the British. And the framers said, no, you can't do them. Effectiveness is irrelevant to this question. You cannot do them. It's about a restraint on power. I think when we think about data used more broadly in the society and the economy, control might be, um, it's certainly what everybody says privacy is about. I mean, we started with Alan Weston, the Supreme Court said it, Congress has said it, you name it, all pretty good authorities, they've all said it's about control. But even if it is, it's an unworkable definition. In other words, it is not conceivable 
that at this moment you all have devices. I have no idea what you're recording. They're embedded in the ceiling. I have no idea what they're recording. For us to engage in the discussion about my exercising control, and by the way, it might differ from the control you want. You want it to be recorded. I don't want it to be recorded. One of us is going to lose here. I don't think you have to say that means one of us has our privacy compromised. So I think then we have to start thinking more creatively about privacy means being not harmed by your data, including harm in terms of profiling or harms in terms of not, not just physical or financial harms. It may be, be not having your data used in shocking or, or unexpected ways. And you have to think about the Supreme Court's jurisprudence around common law privacy. The words outrageous come up a lot. You know, you can't use the data in an outrageous manner. Um, I think one way in which I think control is a useful word is that you don't want data to be out of control, meaning I may not be exercising control, but I want someone to be exercising <laughs> control over the data. I don't want them just free floating out there so anyone gets them, and then I worry about identity theft or, or, or other types of clear and demonstrable harms. Okay. So, Ken, we were talking yesterday a little bit, and you know, historically when we think about privacy, we think about the Fourth Amendment, and we were having a conversation about some of the implications of metadata that are not about the Fourth Amendment so much, but about the First Amendment and some of the associational rights and freedoms that might be put at risk, and I think are certainly at the core of some of Amalia's concerns about associations and the extent to which they're used to do predictive um, data mining. And could you talk a little bit about private life and freedom of association and how this relates to big data and what you might think some of the profitable areas we should be thinking of for solutions? Yeah, and I, I, this goes to the suggestion that it's a lot more <laughs> than control over any particular piece of information or data. Um, in earlier periods of history, not much earlier, there were much more effective physical or systemic constraints on other folks' ability to gather data about you and also to connect that data. Even if court records were public, they were not electronically available. Uh, even if you shared photographs of you with your closest associates uh, and your friends and with, with your friends and family, it didn't mean that other people could go online and grab that data too. And it certainly didn't mean that a system could uh, employ very sophisticated facial recognition, tag you so that everyone knows who your associates were two or three or four or five years previously. Um, and, I, and I think uh, what is threat, the loss that is threatened is the loss over a space in which people can, can exercise uh, what we might, in a, in a kind of First Amendment context, think about their associational rights. So it's not people's choice about, oh, I want uh, my preference for a king-size mattress instead of a queen-size mattress to be passed on to the sheet manufacturer or not. It's, do I want everything about me? who I'm connected with, when I was connected with them, who I'm speaking to, the notion that uh, metadata that only indicates uh, uh, who I've been in contact with, how frequently and how long is so, somehow harmless, th that I think strikes many individuals as, as a problematic assertion. So uh, all of these questions about who we're intimate with, uh, what our religious context is, can we have different sets of friends, different sets of people we're connected to. Can we just have a space where nobody knows what we're doing, uh, where nobody knows what restaurants we're coming into and going out of? Um, th these things, I think, are very important in terms of preserving an individual's ability to be who they are and to change over time, to grow over time. And I think uh, within the anti-discrimination laws in, uh, in a whole variety of US contexts, from bankruptcy to racial discrimination, there are all kinds of categories of information that obviously people could know about or do know about, but they're not allowed to use. They're, they're, in, in a sense, you're, you're told to, to pretend, uh, uh, I don't know this information about the person. I don't know that they previously took advantage of our bankruptcy system when engaging in a, a, a credit decision uh, about them in the future. I don't know what their race is because we've decided that that's not appropriate. So even though we could easily find out those things, we don't. And we have constraints on whether we can use them or not. And so I think the question uh, about values is, uh, 
are there legal or technological means that we can put into place that recreate this public space and this ability for people to grow, be free, choose, uh, and not be constantly under the constraint of knowing that they're being surveilled or watched at all times, or even worse, not knowing, but knowing that they could be under surveillance at all times. So Amalia, the conversation about, from Fred and Nikki, about power and now Ken tying it into not just power of the government vis-a-vis -vis the citizen, but also power of all these various entities that shape our actual life opportunities and the extent to which data is being brought to bear in <coughs> tinier and tinier and like kind of lower and lower down the food chain, I know is of deep concern to you. Could you talk a little bit about um, some of the tools that you think might be useful, if we understand that control isn't enough, right, that the profiles that are being developed that might limit your life opportunities when you go to buy something or uh, whatever it might be, might not be your data, right? It's somebody else's data that's informing those decisions. What sorts of remedies, what could we pull from? Are there good models to think about advancing some of the limits of privacy Sure, so I think um, I want to come at the question from two ends because I think that in this particular context, you know, with the lawyers and the policymakers and the technologists in the room, you know, there are innovative solutions that can build on, you know, historical sorts of barriers or protections that were set up. So certainly we think of some of the civil rights legislation um, looking at key areas that people's lives are impacted in, housing, education, healthcare, those sorts of things. But I want to invite into the conversation a moment um, where we actually start at the other end of the spectrum, which is with the end user. Um, and what is it actually, what would it look like to actually engage with end users, not in a moment of crisis where they found the information had been used in a really harming way, but to actually ask them as they begin the process of learning how to navigate in this online world, what would make them feel more comfortable? And we've actually heard some very profound things from people. I think one, People want to learn, as they develop the, the digital literacy to operate in an online world, they want to know the different ways that information is being used. They want to have a sense that there are easy places to get redress. They want to have a sense that there are people who can accompany them through the process from a trusted institution, community anchor institutions, for example. They want to understand that if there's a mistake made, that there's a way that they can go back and fix that sort of mistake and that there is support to be able to do that. So I think it's kind of looking at this question from both ends, like what are the policy and the legal um, sort of legislation, all kinds of solutions that we can put out that are bigger, and at the same time, how do we hold in mind the individual who can help shape this? And I think that in this kind of conversation, um, it's often challenging because we don't have ways for sort of the everyday person to be part of this conversation. But I think if we did, um, you would hear some of these stories of how people are just scrambling to sort of catch up with um, with a profile that's being created about them in these very desperate situations where they also need, know that they need to get online, their children need to go, go online, and this sort of online future is, is tied to everything in their life, housing, education, job searches, healthcare, and all of those things. So what sort of interventions do you imagine when you think about trying to engage people in kind of the big data ecosystem? We know, you know much of the data that is being used to make decisions is collected by parties who are kind of behind the first party, right? Data brokers, other people who are processing information in the background. You know, how do you think about educating people about those institutions that they've probably never had a relationship right. to? Who do you think is the right place for people to go to understand this sort of ecosystem? So I think obviously, uh, you know, with the transparency piece that we've been talking about, there's just a lot of disclosure that needs to happen. Like, who are these third parties? What are they collecting? What are proxies? How are proxies used? How is sort of, you know, a societal understanding of, of different issues, you know, are proxies stand-ins for things around race or gender or religious affiliation or all of these different things that ma um, matter to people's lives. I think that for community folks especially, you know, there needs to be a point in this conversation where we're actually talking to trusted anchor institutions because I can imagine sometime in the future where people are very confused about what's going on in their life. They find that they're caught in a situation where a whole entire um, data profile has been created about them and where do they turn? 
And, and I'm going to guess that in many cases they're going to turn to a public library. And I think about the public librarians, and I think about, <laughs> I'm looking at Zita, and I think about, you know, going to some of these city libraries where there's 100, 200 people waiting in line on the first of the month trying to fill out their different, you know, social welfare forms or job applications. And I think about what would it be like to be a librarian, you know, and have someone come up to you and say, for example, there's information about my fair credit reporting, you know, that's inaccurate. Oh, guess what? I applied for a job and it says that I have a felony that I don't have. Or, oh, guess what? <laughs> guess what? You know, it says that we were, you know, we foreclosed on our mortgage and maybe we did or maybe we didn't. And so, I, you know, I just want to hold um, in this conversation that we also realize that there are some frontline people that are probably being inundated now, if not in the near future. And so the need, librarians and the librarians, they provide free lunch, I think, now on the weekends. And next, they're going to they be helping people with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I, like, I love the librarians. Um, so it, it sounds like this is an area where we need to think more richly about solutions. We don't have a good idea of exactly the direction to go in with respect to this yeah. sort of interface. So Nikki and Ken, um, algorithms. <laughs> um, both of you, right, the, the civil liberties and technology, right, this is your, your mandate. At, the ACLU, um, and Ken, you've thought a lot about the way in which um, some of the obfuscation that happens when we use technology in the context of trying to comply with the rule set, the way in which it shifts the balance of power between people who are traditionally thought of as making the value decisions, the lawyers, the policy people in an organization, and the people who are supposed to be merely implementing, right, the technical people who are building out the system. As probably most of the people in this room who sit at that nexus know, there's a big translation gap between what a concept like privacy or even a clearly written law like HIPAA um, and how it's actually implemented on the ground. And algorithms are kind of in this place, right, that they're trying to help an institution um, meet some set of goals or obligations. And yet, there's some real open questions about what sorts of biases might end up in those algorithms, how we might interrogate them. Uh, when we think about data mining, or we think about big data and some of these predictive algorithms, there is some serious challenges. Um, we could think about open source or disclosed code requirements. However, I would challenge people with great technical sophistication to actually understand what the output of any given algorithm is going to be on a particular set of data. So our traditional um, goals of scrutinizing seem to be quite challenged when we think about this sort of complex technology that could be learning as it goes along. And I'm wondering what sort of opportunities do we have on the legal side, on the technical side, to give us some greater certainty that we are not acting in ways that are unfair, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, just sort of building on what Amalia was talking about in terms of transparency, I do think, and sort of how it's linked to algorithms, um, I do think that transparency is not the solution or a solution, but I think that it can, it can be a really important part of spurring change and ensuring fairness and ensuring that there's at least knowledge about what's going on behind the curtain. And I think that we've seen transparency spark change effectively in ways when it's really personal and tangible to an individual when people can sort of mirror back and see what kind of information is being collected about them, who it's being shared with, and also what inferences are actually being made behind the scenes about who they are that may be correct or absolutely incorrect. Um, whether or not somebody has a certain type of disease or they defaulted on their mortgage or not. And we're seeing this increasingly happen that false information is moving through the mm -hmm. system. And so I just want to go back to the fact of transparency that it isn't the solution, but I think if we're going to think about operationalizing some of the things that are talked about in terms of transparency and access in the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, if we're going to try and answer some of what you know, Secretary Pritzker um, asked about at the MIT Forum, how do we make sure that consumers have a, a somewhat better sense of what they're sharing? Um, and how do we make sure that transparency can be um, 
what FTC Chairwoman Ramirez has talked about, that it can be a key to accountability, a key to learning what's been shared, a key to building trust for companies, that we do need to think about some sort of simple and straightforward ways that we can make sure that Americans have at least the rights that Europeans already have to learn what information's been collected about them, and that we build on things like laws here in California where consumers have the ability to learn what information's been shared about them. To me, that seems like a fundamental piece, both to spark consumer change, to incentivize companies to actually do things that are pro-privacy, um, and to also spark policy change. Nothing's been sort of clearer than in the past year that when the public and policymakers know that something is now happening, that change happens. And so I do want to say I think that's really important and that we define knowing what's been collected about you and what's being shared as much more than PII because it's about inferences, it's about location, it's about a whole range of data that many companies don't define as, as personally identifiable but sure are about my private life. Um, and so I think that's a really important piece, and I, I hope that we don't lose that. It's, it's not the end result, um, but I think it's a really a linchpin that we need to really consider and make sure it gets implemented. Um, so uh, the use of analytics, meaning um, high-tech uh, computer analysis of lots and lots of data to come up with inferences, predictions, conclusions, warnings is extraordinarily useful in a world where uh, there is so much data floating around and it's the only way we can start thinking about many types of risk. At the same time, there are three problems uh, or categories of problem that arise consistently when one is dealing with these technical analytics. The first uh, is a question of translation. Uh, when we're trying to translate public policy that very often involves judgments, values, uh, discussions about what privacy means into analytics, into ones and zeros in a digital context, uh, we're speaking two different languages and very often the translation of human judgment into uh, dis deciding and choosing on specific outcomes, either it is or it isn't or either it is these five things or it isn't these five things, uh, end up sometimes being bad translators of our values into, into what's being decided. The second problem is a problem of bias, and bias comes in in two ways. First of all, in that translation process, uh, for example, if part of the analytics involves uh, the, the um, uh, creation of profit, then sometimes, the profit-making uh, analytic might be much easier to translate into the analysis, into the technology, than things like protect privacy while making profit. Uh, it also might create a system by which it's much easier to read at the end of the day what the effect on profit will be than the effect on privacy. And therefore, decision makers frequently go towards the easier, the thing that's more easier, e more easily measured, i.e., the profit, rather than the privacy. And, and the third problem is one of production. That if one's world is created by outputs that are shown to one uh, uh, based on what a set of analytics thinks about you, thinks about what you might be interested in, thinks about what you are good at or not good at, and those are the only things you see or the things you see increasingly in both the on online and offline world, then you become that. A simple example someone mentioned yesterday, the use of analytics in terms of deciding uh, or identifying in children what they will be good at. Once you introduce that kind of analytic into the education of a child, you've taken tracking potentially to the nth degree. At the same time, it might be useful in in, in identifying uh, uh, talents. Let me just point out the one area in which analytics have been used uh, the most pervasively is in the analysis of financial risk. Uh, in fact, uh, all of the banks were using these type of analytics of, of huge databases uh, before uh, the episodes that ran into the last recession. And we saw each of these problems, translation, bias, and production. And these are the kind of cautions we should take seriously here. <laughs>
Okay, so I want to go back. Um, both Fred and Amelia have talked about harms. And I think Fred said, you know, control, okay, maybe it gets us a little way there, seems really at odds with operating in an environment where data is emanating off of all of our devices. Um, but this idea that there are certain harms that we might want to avoid, treating people unfairly, intruding on their private life, whatever the scope of that might be, abusing power in a way that chills people's freedom of association or exploration of new identities and ideas. Those all seem like potentially things that we'd want to protect, we wouldn't want to interfere with. Um, and it's interesting when we think about kind of some of the jurisprudence in this area, we can think about the Kylo case, right? Many of you may remember the use of a thermal imaging device to um, look at the heat signatures coming off of a house um, as a tool to figure out whether or not somebody might be growing pot, right? And the idea that even though that was technically possible with a relatively cheap device that was relatively publicly available, although that's not what the court case ended up saying, um, and it was something that was external to the house, right? It was not contained within the four walls of the house. It was leaking, right, um, was still something that government was not to be accessing without appropriate process, right, that they needed a warrant even though they could technically do it. Um, and because there was some harm, right, that there was this idea that we might learn something about the lady of the house's saunaing activities, right, her private life. And we see something similar, some of the recent FTC settlements um, around using um, cameras in computers to identify where they are, which of course is in people's homes, right? As a tool for protecting the interests of the person who, who leased the computer to someone, right? So some sympathy for both the police who were trying to go after, who were people who were at that time were criminals, perhaps not today always, um, and in the context of the computers in the private sector, people who are, they have a business model, they're leasing things, and they want to be able to track down their property, right? So some sympathy for the use of data in those contexts. However, some notion that there was a boundary that was overstepped, that there was some harm, there was some intrusion that the law ought not to allow because of some of the harms that might flow from it. Today we have these devices that many of us carry or we are, might actually be embedded in our house and um, not because Nicole knows anything about this but just because it's a really great example. Um, many of you probably remember the Google Wi-Fi incident, right, where we have these Wi-Fi routers in our houses. People have their machines and they might not actually realize that they need to encrypt the signal from their machine to their router. And when you drive around, you can sniff that traffic, and that traffic includes people's communications and other data that's flowing back and forth. And frankly, there was an easy technical fix, right, that if people really wanted that to be private, well, why didn't they encrypt it, right? It's technically possible. And the law, um, while you know, this was found to not be a good behavior um, by Google, the, the law, in fact, is really kind of interesting in this area. But again, we have this idea that there was this activity that was happening in a private space that probably individuals understood as private, yet it was accessible from outside the four walls. Nobody had to physically trespass to gain access to that information. And more and more, if we think about the smart grid or we think about our connected cars or the devices, we are leaking. Right? Our buildings are leaking information about the activities of the inhabitants that many people view as quite private. So I'm wondering as this cont these containers that have created a barrier, a structural barrier that have protected private life become more porous, um, we see these instances where law says, well, I don't care that technically you could get access to that information. It's still harmful for you to have that information, at least without some appropriate constraints and process. So Fred, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you see the harm influencing the development of our policies and practices here, how some of the existing case law, FTC settlements might be useful in thinking about some of these big data challenges where we have all these leaky always on devices. 
And, and I have 45 minutes for this Yes, answer, you have. Or? Well, I have a 45 minute question. You can um, have Well, let me say, first of all, I don't think most of those cases reflected on harm. In other words, I think they reflected on violating legal rules. And that's what, in many ways, I'd call more of the European approach. Like, of course there was harm. You didn't put it on the right color paper when you gave it up the disclosure. It was an assumption that it was harm. That's right. Yes. And when I say harm, I mean harm, like what an, what an individual would consider harm. I don't care what color you filed it on. Was I affected negatively by your use of, uh, of the information? And I think it's important we, we keep that straight. I think it's also important we realize that increasingly, and I think, we've, I think we've touched on this before, but nobody said it, most data is not going to be collected. In other words, most data used in action is going to be inferred or, or created. And so again, this is why we talk about things like control, whether lack of control is a harm. If it's not my data, I'm going to have a really hard time making any sort of case that I should control it. So then we come back to the, what I mean by harm, which is really where you are affecting somebody in a way that that materially uh, makes them less well off or affects their reputation or affects their, their safety or their financial security or, or, or what have you. And I think there are a couple of things we could see there, um, one of which, which unfortunately uh, uh, David and Julie, who were both in the room, have heard me say, say before, I think this is an area where actually the FTC could be enormously influential, has been enormously influential, but could be more so in the future, frankly, by prompting discussion about it. Not through a regulatory approach, but for example, the three workshops that the commission did three years ago that really helped, I think, inform their thinking and a lot of our thinking about privacy a similar series on harm might be a really useful approach to bring together different people so that the people who make these decisions in companies and government agencies and others would know not only their thinking, but would have a broader framework of what other people think harm might be. I think a second point about harm, in, and this was a conclusion made with regard to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and I think if it was true in 1970, it's even more true today, and that is it is much easier to deal with harm as a matter of redress. In other words, I could look at your algorithm all day long, and I'm not going to know whether I'm going to be harmed by it. And frankly, almost nobody will. Maybe Danny will. But like nobody else in the room is going to be able to look at the algorithm and say, yep, this is going to harm me. And so I'm not arguing against transparency around the algorithms, but I think from my point of view, that's like window dressing. The real focus is when an individual is acted on that I get notice and an opportunity to uh, uh, to see and then respond to if I think the data are inaccurate or, or if the inference is based on faulty data or if it's been attributed to the wrong person or, or uh, 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 what have you. So and I'm going to push on that a little bit. Uh, go, so that feels away. like whack-a-mole to me, right? It feels like, oh, and it's another person and another person. And, right, and one of the things we know from privacy, or at least we think we know, we hope we know, um, is that getting people in on the ground floor when you're designing a system, right, that actually can shape and try to avoid some of the privacy risks, mitigate, right? We have a whole slew of privacy professionals who use privacy impact assessment, information flow, they, they diagram systems, they look, are there new identifiers? Are you gonna be phoning home? Are you opening a connection? That they actually try to shape things to proactively but that's prevent that's exactly what outcomes. redress will do. That's it. So that's the way it works today. So you so think it'll prompt. The FTC comes and whacks a mole, and then all the other little moles in the neighborhood look around and they say, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't get, want to get whacked. Uh, but there are so some professionals It, it may there. or may not work. Right. Well, I'm not changing the professionals. I still think privacy people will have jobs. But are they going to now be responsible will. for fairness? I think they're going to now be responsible for a more comprehensive form of risk analysis. And so rather than just saying, does this comply with a law or not, which has not gotten us very far since we don't have a lot of law around most of this, they're now going to be involved in a bigger discussion. That's another reason I, I think the FTC or other agencies should help signal. You know, our view of harm is pretty broad. It's, it's gone a long way. And so it's not just unencrypted wireless signals with credit card data. We have a much broader view of harm so that then internally institutions will say, now we're going to internalize that. We're going to act on that. It won't be perfect. But it's frankly the way we have administered laws for four decades. Okay, and but I don't let's know be that we really have a clear. Have, have any of you tried to like re-engineer a system? It can be really expensive, right? There's a, there's a lot of cost in that approach. And and Nikki, with respect to public systems, right? How might 
these conversations happen on the ground floor, given that, as you said, some of this, it's not going through typical channels of allocation of funds. It's circumventing our typical political process. Some of it comes out of drug forfeiture money. It's right. coming through DHS grants. That are, what sort of mechanisms do we need to make sure that at least there's a place for the mole to be whacked? Right. Well, <laughs> I agree that the mole needs to be whacked, okay, but, and redress needs to happen, but I guess I fundamentally and many people agree that privacy is not just the sword to whack the mole. Privacy is the shield you know, to prevent the potential harm from happening. That it's the shield, that it's the protection, that it's the safeguard so that the harm doesn't actually happen. The protection of our families, our personal lives, our self. Um, and I think that sort of the proliferation of government surveillance is sort of a prime example of this, that we shouldn't have to wait until um, we can prove that an individual has been discriminated against on the ground if there's, you know, a facial recognition system deployed. That there should, privacy should actually require and the government should require that there's public process and that there's enforceable safeguards put in place um, before grant money is deployed to local communities that, that make sure and discuss how are the projects going to be used. What kind of information is going to be collected? How is it going to be disclosed? And these are things that are not sort of revolutionary. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security actually put together an entire workshop in 2007, um, came up with a list of best practices and a privacy impact assessment um, that was intended that you know local communities that got grant money would go through this process, and it was never implemented. That's sort of one sensible step that if there was actually a process implemented and a privacy impact assessment and enforceable safeguards required before millions of dollars came down to a local community, which honestly doesn't have the resources to think through these things appropriately, that would be a help in sort of the first bucket that I talked about. Um, and I think that that's something that would be a sort of very low hanging fruit and try and address some of these situations would privacy as a shield and not just have to wait till the harms have actually happened down the line. Can, so can I just yet, say, wait, by the way, uh, I, I agree with that, but we've also shifted ground. We're now talking about public sector where, we're as coming I said, back. We're I think back. It, with the public sector, privacy is a restraint on government power. When the government abuses that power, the harm is instantaneous because it's used power it did not have. Mm -hmm. I think in the private sector where we were with the Federal Trade Commission, we can't say it that clearly. It, it's, it's not that clear. There's no constitutional basis that says the private sector does not have the power to use data. We would have to craft these rules in, individually. Public, it's much clearer. Okay. I guess in California, you would have a slightly different perception of our constitutional you know, landscape applying both to but, the government. But no and court the has sector. applied it differently. In other words, when courts confront the California constitutional provision, they still end up ruling the way they do in every other state. So that's yeah, part of the challenge is, is to make laws. Doctrine, which is part of that situation that, you know, just because we share information with a company here in California, it doesn't mean we've abdicated our expectation of privacy in it and our constitutional rights to right. privacy. Right, and that's that public sector. We totally agree with you on public yeah. sector, yeah. So harm. One of the things that we know, I think, from the context of trying to police equality commitments, right, or looking to police discrimination in the marketplace is that proving harm, figuring out exactly how the decision making went wrong can be quite complicated and time consuming. It's difficult to police. We do have mechanisms where we do that, right? Um, and I'm wondering in the big data environment, how do you think about this harm-based model? Is harm in redress enough? If it was harm in redress, what sort of facilities would be necessary? I'm, I'm not really imagining we have block grants to libraries. Are there other ways in which we might think about <coughs> redress? Um, from the very beginning, right, the HEW Fair Information Practice Principles were about privacy and due process, right? They were about how do we make sure that people are made whole? Um, it seems in the context of fairness, we actually, and I think Fred was, was saying this in part, we have understandings of what unfair might be. We don't actually have an idea of what fairness is to build to, right? What does it mean to treat everybody fair, fairly? I don't know exactly how to hand that 
to somebody to build and implement, whether it's through policy or through an algorithm. Um, so does that mean that we're left continuously identifying harms and saying, oh, this was a bad outcome, don't do that again? Or is there something more proactive? Oh, so much. I was going to try to go with the, the mole analogy, but I think that ship has, <laughs> has sailed. Um, so a couple things. I mean, I think one, again, this conversation about big data and what it means for our future, I mean, I think is fundamentally, it's a national conversation because it suggests something about where we're going as a country, what that means for our position in the world, what it means for big questions like our democracy and all of these things. And I think given that it's, a, it's such a big conversation, it means that it needs to involve more, more people, right? So one of the things, you know, people have been giving examples of different things, and one of, one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, when the FCC was faced with this question of the open internet, and we were, part, we were one of the organizations that helped um, organize the field town halls. And I remember very early on in the conversation, people were like, oh, no one will come out. No one will come out to talk about the open internet. But you know, whether it was Minneapolis, or whether it was Oakland, or Albuquerque, I mean, the smallest audience we had was, you know, around 1,000 people. And hundreds of people at line, you know, lining up at the microphones to give one and two minute testimonies about what the internet meant to them. And, and I think that we would see the same thing around this question of privacy and surveillance and big data, you know, depending on how you frame it. And I think one of the things that we could get from those conversations is to ask these sorts of questions like, how is this problem being framed? You know, who or what is the conflict between and what's at stake? And I think hearing some of those things from people on the ground, you know, would suggest some of the ways we shape, like, how harm is mitigated. Is it preventative? Is it proactive? What does it look like? So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is I think that what we're suggesting is that in all aspects of this process, we need to engage people in more meaningful um, elements of protection. You know, so whether it is, you know, around government surveillance and not being able to share data without a warrant, you know, that's something that we talk about in our, you know, our principles. Whether it's about, you know, enhanced protection around inaccurate data, whether it's around, you know, sort of fairness, which came up yesterday, and I think that, you know, to that point, this question of, you know, is fairness enough? Um, and I think that in our group, at least, we were left sort of wondering, like, are we, maybe let's take one more step in, in um, a visionary future and suggest that fairness isn't enough, that what we want to do is look at equity. And equity then kind of turns us back to these conversations about, you know, acknowledging that there's implicit bias that has hurt different communities in different ways, and that without sort of baking that into the technological solutions, we're going to be in the same place. So does that answer it cleanly? No, but I think that, you know, hopefully it offers some new conversation points around who else could be in the room and how we shape that. Well, so when you want to you wanna go to Walmart, for example, because I think that you've looked at them a little <laughs> bit, and you want to have this conversation, right? I know if I have a privacy concern, I want to talk to Apple, I call Jane Horvath, right? I know who to call. There's a chief privacy officer there. Who do you talk to? Where does this issue sit institutionally? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the Walmart example. So obviously, you know, with Color of Change and the UFCW, we did this report on all of the data points and sort of, we called it spying, um, that Walmart was doing on consumers and, you know, all of the negotiations and interactions with third parties. And maybe two weeks ago, I was at a national meeting um, for the UFCW with their Walmart campaign. And it was, it was fascinating because there, are organ there were organizers in the room, you know, union leaders and organizers who had looked at the report, it was 20 or 30 pages long, it was a lot to digest. But they were concerned about what was happening. You know, and again, I think it's that point of finding these trusted institutions, helping you know, develop sort of the translators and bridge builders between this technological language that not everyone is fluent in, I certainly am not, you know, and the literacy and language of what it means to be a person going through life feeling safe feeling like you have sort of a zone you can operate in freely, understanding how that relates to your other associations, work, health, home, life, et cetera. You know, and so I think it's, it's finding these, I guess what I'm saying is there's these moments of developing the translators and finding individual translators, but also finding institutional translators that we need to start building up because it's a conversation that's too big and too technical to have on a micro level, yet, yet those intervention points need to live at the local level. And it's also the means to get access to the information to share with other people. I think that we have increasingly, um, you know, this disconnect where, you know, it requires an investigative reporter to figure yeah. out how your information traveled somewhere <laughs> or a congressional inquiry to right. figure mm -hmm. out how data brokers got particular information. So 
I think that's a fundamental problem because if you don't know that something's happening, it's very hard to then care and then create the change you want to see in the world. So, you know, kind of going back to that piece of transparency, it's it's a means to at least being in a position to find some solutions. Th these last points seem to me to suggest that it's important to push back on three points. Um, the first is that uh, the best way to deal with privacy is in response to legally cognizable harms. The second is that we should do that best after the fact, after those harms have manifest. And the third is that you know, uh, we shouldn't worry too much about who's behind the curtain once the information has been handed off you know, we're, we're not as concerned about how things continue to go. I think each of those points has got to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, harms as currently understood in the legal system mostly involve monetary harms. And the things that we've been talking about today are far bigger than that. They involve uh, uh, harms to fairness, harms to equity, harms to dignity, um, the, the notion you know, I think many people's intuitive response of this week that it turns out that Google Glass, the indicator that someone is taping you, uh, can can or, or recording you or surveilling you, can be hacked to be turned off so that you don't know. Wow, that strikes people. There, there, there may be no monetary harm, but the notion that there is this potential for comprehensive and ongoing surveillance that can be made eternally public, that's a problem, and that's that's a different kind of harm. Um, uh, second, the notion that uh, after the fact is when law or enforcement or regulation should come in really, I think, undermines uh, the whole notion that both business and uh, 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 privacy professionals in, in government um, share, which is the notion that it is much, much cheaper, much more efficient, and much more effective to deal with privacy issues right at the beginning that it's almost impossible sometimes to, to slap it on at the end, but it actually has to be part of the decision of how much information you collect, uh, how long you're gonna store the information, what the defaults are, that those questions are in fact baked in to whatever technological system you're doing. And finally, this notion that um, you know once, once uh, you've given a certain kind of formalistic consent that somehow the information can then be passed along for eternity and into who knows hands and can be combined with other information in ways that that constrain your choices in the future uh, is it's it's got to be law and it's got to be policy and it and it's got to be conversations like the one the White House has started here mm -hmm. that that are going to address these questions okay so I am about to open this up for questions from the audience but I want to take one little um, directed question first, which is uh, many of you probably don't know this, but because I spent a lot of time in DC working on things like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, I happen to know that John Podesta was one of the drafters of it. <laughs> um, and he then went on to be the person who wrote the authoritative manual on the Electronic Communications Privacy Act for the Electronic Mail Association, which he very nicely shared with me when I was writing, I think, one of the first articles looking at the quote unquote unreasonable expectations of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And while that law was incredibly prescient, right, and it was important not just because it established um, some pushback against this notion that any time we disclose an information, information about ourselves or our communications to a third party that we have somehow abandoned any privacy interest in it, that that isn't the sort of world we want to live in, even if the court at that point thought that the third party record doctrine meant that it was the world we would live in. Um, but it was also really important in that it reflected an opportunity between the civil liberties community and the corporate community to say privacy is an enabling part of this infrastructure. Privacy regulation is not a barrier to innovation. Regulation to protect privacy was in fact 
a foundational component in order to allow innovation to happen. People were not going to share their information, they were not going to use email if that information was going to be readily available to the government without any legal process, right? Privacy was an enabler of innovation, and I think that's a really important piece of this conversation. So what's the question? Well, ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, envisioned a world in which the thing that was private was our communication, right? That we knew the outside of the envelope had the addresses on it, the quote unquote metadata, and the inside of the envelope was where all the really good stuff was, right? And the stuff that we wanted to keep private. And the structure of the law protects our communications, but provides relatively little, and in some instances, no protection for that transactional data that helps things get from one point to another. So it was an incredibly important law. However, I have to say we had a little bit of a lack of imagination about what the internet would look like today. When we look today, it's all about user-generated content. We're all sharing what used to be inside the envelope, right? The entire internet, what people are withholding, what they care to protect is that metadata. Right? They don't want you to know where they're. I tell my daughter, you can use Instagram, turn off the location information function. I don't want people to know where you are. They can hear what you have to say. You have a right to speak. Go, girl. I don't want them to know where you are or where you live or where you're going next or who you're with. Right? And so when we look at ECPA as this fabulous, important statute, we also look at the way in which our use of the technology has changed. And some of the fundamental assumptions about what was shared and what was secret have shifted due not to the technology so much, but due to our use and appropriation and our desire to use this as a platform for organizing, whether it's political organizing or issue organizing, and for being social, right? That we use all of the beautiful technologies in order to build and strengthen our communities, whether they're educational communities or healthcare communities or our own personal lives. And so thinking about this, the shape of the law as it is now, John, if you were rewriting ECPA, what would you do? <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to answer that later. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there was no internet. This is true. Yes. There was email and remote storage. Yeah. Well, if, if we are rewriting ECPA, this is what we That's would do. That's what we should do. <laughs> no, so but I actually. It's out there. We just released a new report, Metadata, Piecing Together the Privacy Solution. And, and it really is about these issues that we have these analog legal distinctions in this mm -hmm. modern digital world. You know, people were very prescient in 1986, but there's only so much you can do when, you know, before the web existed and cell phones were the size of bricks and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was in diapers. So, you know, <laughs> we, we need to do a little bit of advancement um, on the law. And I think that it's very possible, you know, we've got a bipartisan bill that's been introduced. We've got also a lot of movement on the states as well about these issues. And I think that's another one of sort of the low hanging fruit where, updating ECPA, but also really thinking about metadata that, you know, in this modern digital world, non-content doesn't mean not sensitive. And that's just our new reality. And we have to, you know, we've got these privacy laws in the digital dark ages, and we, we just need to upgrade them for our modern digital world. I think it's very doable. Um, there's a lot of agreement on this, again, between the civil liberties groups and the business community. Um, and we've got really good models out there that are that are ready to be implemented and operationalized. Um, and I think those are those are really big issues that we need to deal with, and and real proposals that that can move forward on these issues. So, John, I actually did want to see if you had a question for the panel. Uh, I'm just taking notes. All right. So I'd like to open it up to the audience. There are some mics around, and there are some cards. There are no mics. There are cards. Yeah. Okay. All right. In the discussion of transparency, I, I would say one of the things that really didn't come up is the transparency of the way data is tagged and accessed inside mm -hmm. the environment of the public and private sector. And I wonder whether you think that's an important question. I mean, this is, uh, people like me 
Okay, so in the context of a statutory framework like HIPAA, we have both a right to access our information as well as to know who else has accessed and used the information. And the extent to which that should be kind of standard fare in our discussion about transparency. Um, I, I think it's a great question. I don't have a great answer for it. I, I think it's uh, worth remembering, it's a good prompt for the fact that transparency may mean all sorts of different things in different settings. So maybe transparency to the public, it may be transparency to individuals who are affected, maybe transparency to regulators. But I also think we need to think about transparency within institutions. And for example, in the time that I spent on committees looking at various government data mining programs, in almost every case, the big revelation is that nobody at this level knew what people at this level were doing. And a little internal transparency would have gone a long way, not necessarily towards stopping it, but towards shaping it or framing it or at least putting a message around it. So uh, I would just return, I guess, to the point I made to start. Uh, I, I think transparency is fine, but I think it's not terribly useful for most individuals in most settings. Frankly, because we're overwhelmed by the volume of these transactions and we're not in a position. It, it's a, it, I don't think it was ever a good idea, but it is an unworkable idea in today, and I think in the future it's going to become more so, to think I'm going to police my own data. But I do think at the point that I am affected by my data and therefore have an interest, I stop and I say, wait a minute, then you want to provide uh, transparency in the sense of anything that's relevant to understanding the effect on me. And so it would depend on the setting as to whether the tagging of the data affected the, the outcome, if you will, for the individual. So it could be a potentially very important piece could be of very, redress. Yes. And so having that information to make transparent in a particular moment might be really important. Well, and, and Fred's talking about the sort of end point. I have done a lot of thinking about the beginning point. Mm -hmm. And you know, the fact that when people do have information that's personal and tangible to them about what's being collected and what's being shared, it does lead to many people making different decisions. You know, Pew just did some research that, you know, 57% of the app users that they surveyed made different decisions about apps based on when they learned what information was going to be shared about them. That's significant. You know, 57% of people did that. Um, we've also seen it in our own work. Um, you know, privacy policies aren't particularly effective, but we do see when people actually are given real information about their own information, it does lead them to make different choices. Um, we did a Facebook app about Facebook apps where we actually mirrored to individuals <laughs> what information a app learned about you when you didn't even run the app, but a friend did. Now, Facebook had this as a little blurb in their privacy policy. Nobody really understood it. But when we actually created an app that mirrored back to people what that app learned about them when they had no interaction with that app at all, we had over 150,000 people run through that app and had to change their privacy settings. So when it's, and we've seen behavioral research that you know, when information is salient to an actual individual, when it's individualized to them, it leads to much different choices by those consumers. So, you know, I understand on the piece about redress, but we've done a lot about the right to know and the right to know what information's collected about you, who it's being shared with, um, and what's being shared. And we found both in research and in actions that it actually makes a difference. And it and also incentivizes companies right. to proactively avoid that reputational harm down the way. Ken and Deirdre have done the most work on sort of looking at data breach notification laws and the impact that's had. And we've also seen the EU, we've seen people in the EU actually use their data access rights to spur mm -hmm. policy change. We had a, um, a German member of of the government use his data access rights to learn how much location information had been collected about him. And that actually spurred the company to stop retaining that location information and a major decision by the German Constitutional Court. And we saw the same thing with an Austrian law student about Facebook and how mm -hmm. much information had been collected about him. So I don't think transparency is the solution, but I am going to push back on Fred and say that it can really spur some positive change with consumers with companies and with policy change. And I do think that if it's done right and it's done in a personable and tangible way about what's collected about me, who it's been shared with, and what's been shared, um, 
I think it can, it can really be a linchpin for change. But it sounds like the user interface is a really important piece of yes. this. And I was having a conversation with Ari Gesher yesterday of Palantir, and he was talking about one of the most important things that he views they do for clients is put information in a context, in a language that makes sense to them so that it's meaningful as a decision-making tool. And I think that all of us agree that the notice of what happens isn't really meaningful for most individuals when they're trying to make a decision, whether it's about where their information has been disclosed or who has it or what's going to happen to it. So the user interface designers of the world, you're a really important part of this conversation, I think. And also user interface assumes there's a, a user, there's right. a user, which will not be the case for the vast majority of instrumented data and so forth. So, Again, we have to think of, if you will, multifaceted solutions that will work both in the world in which we are preoccupied with today, but as that becomes insignificant in tomorrow's world, we're going to have to also think about solutions unless, and this is what I thought you were going to ask, John, and I was really wanting to, which is not how would you change ECPA today? I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It's what would you think ECPA is going to look like 10 years from now? I mean, that seems, given that it takes 10 years to get any legislative change through, <laughs> that's the real question, and well, that seems impossible. We're going to overturn know? the third party doctrine. And then <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, do we have another question from the audience? Can you check the platform on the Okay. Down here, Professor Ohm. Should I just shut it up? No, no, this. They're coming. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I want to, is this on? Yeah. There's a button on here somewhere. It's on the bottom. The red light is on. There's no red light. <laughs> just talk just loudly. Gonna, I'm just gonna shout. It may still be recording you, even though the red light I is on. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Okay. So I want to push uh, the colloquy that was happening between Fred and Nikki about public versus private. And I agree entirely with you, Fred. In fact, I've written that the Fourth Amendment really is about power, not privacy. The question is, though, when we think about government accumulation of power, should we take into account the fact that they don't do their own surveillance anymore and instead they've kind of outsourced it to Silicon Valley? And so should either as a constitutional matter or maybe a new statutory fix, should we say you have too much power because this company now knows location and there's nothing in the world that's going to stop you from getting access to it, right? So, so can you imagine a world where we think of the government and the private sector as basically co-partners in the kind of surveillance enterprise, and we tailor our rules according to that realization. Uh, if it's a question to me, the answer is yes. I mean, we do that already. I mean, we have yeah. laws that restrict the ability of certain types of service providers to convey information to the government. No, no, I'm talking about uh, the gathering itself. We tell the industry, right. you probably shouldn't be gathering that or storing it because of the impact it's going to have right. on I, our relationship I, with the government. I, I don't see that because one of the things, this, by the way, isn't a preference I'm expressing. This is just a looking at the world and seeing how it is. There's almost always a legitimate reason to collect the data. In other words, think about what the government wants from phone companies or wants from internet companies. Well, what are you going to say? I'm not going to make phone calls or you can't collect my phone number when I make a call, which is going to make all sorts of services which I value, like last number called, disappear because I can't. So there's almost always a legitimate reason. It's what the next use of it is that that's where the problem is. So I could easily imagine seeing stronger laws or even constitutional interpretations that would say the government can't get certain types of data or can't get it without certain types of process. But to say, you know, we're just going to have the private sector not collect the data because, you know, we don't really trust our system to keep the government out of it, that seems like kind of throwing in the towel a little early on. You know, we're so afraid of our government, we're going to hide from it. And, and I think it makes more sense to say let's restrain it in the way that the Constitution anticipated <coughs> But I, obviously, I do see a world where there's the understanding that the, there is this interconnected nature of private parties and the government, and that both that constitutional protections need to apply to both because that's the world we live in here in California. You know, in the 1970s, that was understood that you know this modern threat to privacy came not just by the government and not just by private parties, but by both of those and also working in concert in this sort of Venn diagram of connection. And so I think that is the world um, that we need to see and the world that we need to start thinking through. Uh, we've got you know these legal distinctions and, and a federal system that maybe doesn't think that way yet, but I think that we, we absolutely need to. Okay. On that hopeful note, 
We have to end. To be on time. Timeliness is next to God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much.